end up on one of two extremes. Either the grid is never going down and we have like 200 incidents a year, or there's 500,000 attacks on a daily basis. It's very, very extreme numbers. Uh, I wanted to help return some of the uh, baseline discussion. I know a lot of students I have in 515 uh, and a lot of conversations I have look for data points to be able to say that security is important to what we do in the ICS industry. Um, but I've always made the uh, sort of point that hyping up the threats only lead us to a place where we're focusing on hyped up threats, not the actual security challenges that we have. So that was really the, the point of this. So I wouldn't get through a talk if I didn't have at least one little Bobby uh, comic on the slide. This one actually happened to Tim Conway and I. We were at a, a conference together recently. And a, a man I very much respect, who is a, a national level leader, uh, got on stage and was talking about how we really need to take security seriously in the industrial community, especially in the power grid, if only we had some sort of like regulations for the power grid. When Tim and I are starting to look at each other like, uh, well, we got the whole NERC SIP thing. And he's like, oh, all right, well, we really need like a national level exercise to train for when you know, uh, things happen. I'm like, uh, Grid X, we got that covered. And he's like, well, we need a review of uh, what we actually have today. And I'm like, dude, we do this every year. Uh, so uh, very well-intentioned individual, but maybe not aware of, of what we have today. Um, so that's where we came up with some of the hypothesis for this research as well. Uh, I listed them there on the slides. One of the first hypotheses that we had is that there's a lot of infected uh, sort of environments. There's a lot of cases where we have non-targeted, nothing to be concerned about in terms of taking down the power grid, nothing to hype up, but still things that matter, especially for just simple reliability of the network and the, the systems that we rely on. But there's a lot more of those than uh, maybe we understand today. Uh, number two, that the public reports that do go out when we actually see vendors release threat intel reports or some discussion of what those threats are, that those are actually contributing in some manner. Some people are actually looking at security because of those. Uh, number three, we wanted to note that although we don't typically hear a lot about ICS-themed malware, that it's much more popular than people realize. Not necessarily common, but not uncommon. Uh, it is, in my experience, working from government to private sector now, that uh, when I had classified you know, clearances and all sorts of stuff in the government, it was easier to violate those than some of the NDAs that you put in place for like incident response in industrial environments. It's like scarier with more repercussions, um, at least it seems so these days. And uh, the point of that is most people don't talk about things that actually go on in our community. So we wanted to have a little bit of discussion of this. And then lastly, there's some maybe untrained IT security teams that need to have a better appreciation for the files and data in our environments that are important so we don't see a lot of our sensitive files going up to public databases. So to do all of this research, we relied solely on public data. We didn't want to reach into customer networks or anything that we'd have to come up and talk about uh, incidents with particular customers, specifically just public data sets. What has been on the surface and just gone on unexplored? What have IT security teams missed for years because it wasn't interesting enough or maybe they didn't understand ICS software? What's there in plain sight? So, uh, to sort of note that point, <clears throat> what, I typically <clears throat> excuse me, what I typically find is security teams that look to IT security metrics or IT threats and try to wholesale copy-paste that into the ICS. And while that'll get us somewhere in the discussion, we have different things that happen in our environment. I constantly see things like uh, the ICS cert metrics, which are really good and a lot of good focus goes on there, but they tell a different story than I think most people realize. So I pulled these from the 2015 year in review. Uh, the 2014 year in review is the exact same in the construct that the number one attack vector, the number one infection vector is unknown. Well, that's, that's not great. Uh, the number two is spear phishing, which would make a lot of sense if we had email servers in SCADA environments, but we don't. Uh, what the metrics typically actually say, and you can kind of see it in the second graph, is when we see infections or threats in our environment, it's because they came through IT. Uh, but if they're already in the environment, we don't necessarily know how they got there. And, and that's something that we're all as a community trying to work on. Um, but that's because there's things, not only like USBs, but also those vendor connections. Uh, when I see incidents in the community, 
one of the first places I always check is the VPN connections. I commonly see those being leveraged by adversaries. Um, so there's different priorities in what we're doing. Um, we have databases, RISI and, and others, that have tried over the years to, to look at the ICS threat landscape, but there's a couple problems again. Either people don't actively keep these things up and keep contributing to them, there's a good effort that starts and then it sort of fades off a bit, or we don't really validate some of the cases that we have. I don't know for how many years now Mike, Tim, and I have been sort of ringing the bell that the BTC pipeline in Turkey did not explode because of a cyber attack by Russia. Yet you'll see that in news articles and every conference agenda going around and say, you should come to our conference because pipelines can explode. And it's like, we know, but that didn't happen because of cyber. Uh, it's an important thought to actually have a baseline of knowledge. <clears throat> Because remember, we might have a lot of different threats hiding behind that pixelated view. Um, the only difference is we don't seriously think that the squirrels are the biggest threat to the grid. All right, so uh, the idea of what we try to do uh, is have this mimics project. And so Ben's going to walk you through a lot of this research. Um, significant portion of it was actually done by Ben. For anybody that knows him will know that he's very much a go-getter uh, and, and knocking down some really cool research. Uh, MIMIC stands for Malware and Modern ICS. Again, the only data source we had was VirusTotal and public databases. We specifically wanted to find what was in plain sight, what was available to the community over years but maybe hasn't taken advantage of, and have this discussion again of almost like a census data. What can we set as baseline metrics to have a conversation around what we're seeing in the community? And hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll be able to have a more uh, reasoned discussion around malware in the industry, and remember the malware is not always the threat, the human is the threat, but you'll be able to have a better discussion around malware in the industry than relying on hyped up numbers to make a point around security. That's really the point. So with that, I uh, couldn't get through a presentation without referencing the ICS cyber kill chain at least once. What I want to note here is all the malware and all the things we're talking about is that stage one components. Uh, we're not doing, we didn't find, we're not looking at anything that's causing you know, systems to fail, disruption in terms of destruction, uh, levels of attack that can actually take down infrastructure. And I want to stress that because anytime you come out and talk about malware or threats in the community, in the journalism community, it can very quickly spin out of control. So I wanted to make the point now to everybody watching this uh, on YouTube in the future and all sorts of good stuff. We're not talking about headlines that should read, OMG, cyber attacks, power grid goes down. Like, it's just to have a reasoned discussion, non-targeted, first stage intrusion type activity that's important to document and understand. From a words that matter perspective, what we want to know as well is we typically just say malware, so there's differences in our environments and why that matters. Um, we won't spend too much time on this slide, but you'll see us use these words, the difference between a downloader and a dropper, um, the, the file that's actually gone onto the system versus that file that then reaches out to the internet or some other location and, and has a second stage that it pulls down and does further action in the environment, or a virus that might spread, which in our environments may be completely non-targeted, but as we know from years of case studies with things like Conficker, it can still take down operations or still cause disruption on the networks unintentionally, versus a Trojan, which is more of your backdoor capability, the ability to load additional malware, or potentially be able to have remote access. The virus of the self-propagating aspect, we saw a lot of this in our research, as you would expect, because it is uh, more spreading. What I want to note as well before uh, Ben gets into the metrics is why we might say you know, 15,000 examples of a virus that doesn't necessarily mean it's more impactful than the samples of the Trojans that we found, because by their very nature, you wouldn't expect them to spread as commonly. But those Trojans generally give some level of access to an adversary if they want it. I've worked instant response cases before where it was zero access botnets, and people were like, oh, that's just crimeware. And then very quickly we found out, no, uh, more sophisticated adversaries taking advantage of this. You know, we look at back at Havex and Black Energy. Black Energy 2 was based off crimeware. A lot of folks love to get in the habit of saying, oh, it's crimeware, oh, it's uh, this ware, it's that ware. No, it's just a capability, and the right adversary can take advantage of it uh, to their means. Um, so when we look at viruses in general, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about around viruses, just as a precursor, um, generally, you'll have completely legitimate software. This is just a recap for everybody. Completely legitimate software and at some sort of PE entry point or some, some sort of point uh, in the portable executable file of PE, 
you will have the insertion of malicious code, right? What's the problem there? You're not easily ripping it out. So if you just go deploy antivirus, as an example, all across your ICS, and then a virus actually spreads all across your ICS, what's gonna happen? Well, if it's something like Sality or Viruit, uh, you're gonna delete all your ICS files, and we've seen that time and time again. Um, so it's very important to understand the type of capability you're dealing with, even just from a classification perspective, in terms of how you're gonna remediate or clean that up without damaging the ICS. In the same way, when you have the Trojan, a lot of people will make the mistake of saying, I found the Trojan, I cleaned it up, I'm good to go, and completely forget the fact that there's usually a downloader and a second stage and other activity that follows. This happened in, I think I can't get through a talk without mentioning Ukraine now as well. Uh, this happened in Ukraine as well, where there were uh, Oblin Ergos that were impacted or were sort of infected with Black Energy 2 and found Black Energy 2 and found the command and control address and ran the indicators of compromise and cleaned it up and completely missed that the adversaries were still active in their environment because they, once they got access to the environment, they then moved to more, like Mike says, living on the land and leveraging VPNs and things in the environment. So just because you find the malware, especially if it's a Trojan, you might not actually have cleaned up the human threat that you're facing. All right, so with that, I'll get over to more of the uh, sexy data components uh, and let Ben uh, do his song and dance about some of the interesting finds we've had and really some of the impact around it. Well, not dance, okay, whatever. Well, no dancing then. Uh, so th we have a, a couple broad categories of data. The, the, the first one is just the, at scale, what does the data look like? Uh, in, in, in particular for PE infectors, uh, this is generally what we see. So, so we query virus total, which to back up on what virus total is, uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, it's a website, uh, it's owned by Google, and it's open to anyone, you don't need a user account, it's open to the public to upload files, and then it scans a, that file that you upload and uh, checks against, I think it's 60 antivirus engines and reports back what it found. Uh, so if you had one hit or 60 hits, it'll report that out. Uh, it's a repository as well though, uh, really handy for researchers or, or others to search and see uh, what the infections are, when they were first seen, last seen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we use virus total and uh, pulled down approximately 90 to 120 days worth of data, uh, looking at uh, ICS uh, specific uh, files, ICS vendors, uh, uh, paths, uh, uh, registry keys, that sort of thing. And, and what we, we see when we graph it out, uh, I'll skip to the next slide. It, so if, if you uh, include zero detections, uh, this, is, this is the graph. So uh, the, the vast majority is uh, uh, a clean file, a legitimate file that's not compromised, while the rest all along the x-axis there, uh, low hit rate, meaning uh, 10 AV uh, engines flagged it, and then the high hit rate of over 50 uh, uh, flagging that particular file. Uh, when you take out zero, uh, zero detections, you have a graph that more, looks more like this. Uh, generally speaking, the, the high uh, threshold there at the 50 count, those are uh, from, from our observations, generally PE infectors. So the viruses that Rob was talking about uh, where it is embedding itself in the executable and then spreading through the environment, uh, those tend to have the high detection rates. I can, I can add, one of the reasons that tends to be, especially with antivirus, is a lot of your antivirus systems these days are looking more for heuristics, patterns that are obviously malicious regardless of signatures. So a virus is gonna exhibit a lot more patterns for malicious behavior by the spreading than you would necessarily with Trojans. So they typically have, at least in the data that we saw with ICS related software, a higher infection or a higher um, AV count rate. Um, but we also found, of course, and we'll get to it later, all the AV systems that looked at ICS software that was infected and didn't alert on it because ICS software is kind of weird anyways. Uh, and, and so we had a lot of stuff going sort of flying below the radar. So I don't think this is the total data, but as we were talking about sort of the baseline expectations of what you might find in the data set. Yeah, and, and again, this was only uh, 90 to 120 days uh, based on the, uh, when I was doing the query. <coughs> Um, so it's a small sample size, uh, yet it gives a, a good understanding of the, the volume uh, of P infectors that are out there that are directly tied to ICS files. So we're not talking about tens, we're not talking about hundreds, uh, we're in the thousands over uh, approximately a 100-day or, or period. 
uh, which I, I found interesting. Like, mm -hmm. we never really had a number to put to that. Maybe it was a really bad uh, couple months, though. No, I think, it, yeah, go ahead. So if we then take that chart and spread it out by vendor, I don't have the vendor names listed here, uh, but I was curious just to see what the differences uh, based on the, the actual ICS vendor look like uh, as far as infection rates uh, and if there would be any, any differences. Um, and, and there, as you can see, some, some notable differences as well as counts. Uh, the middle uh, top chart is in the thousands, I, I think around uh, 12, 12, 1200. Uh, whereas uh, the one right below it is at three, is the, the high bar. And one of the reasons we decided not to put the vendor names in there is we don't want that to become the story. Like Siemens is worse than Emerson, is worse than ABB, and that's not really true. It's what adversaries are targeting the environments. The vendors don't have control over that. So we abstracted the vendor names specifically because it doesn't really matter for the data set. It's just a note that you can definitely tell a difference in what interests adversaries. And as you would expect, the vendor names that are not in your top 10, uh, they have a lot less interest from adversaries because it's not something they're gonna quickly find on Google and go, oh, I wanna target a Siemens environment. <laughs> when you start talking about some lesser known vendors, uh, it's harder for adversaries typically to research those and start targeting those environments. It's also a bias towards the end user. So yep. the, so the volume of users and the, the volume of users that are actively using VirusTotal directly correlate to, to a lot of these charts as well. Um, so when AAV detects something, it usually it has a weird acronym, uh, W32 slash Trojan dot AZ salady, whatever. Um, so I, I chopped up all, all of those words and, and graphed them based on detection count. Uh, and uh, what's notable, do I have a laser? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Well, the, the, the big the arrow. arrow. <laughs> yeah. the, the big arrow is pointing towards Stuxnet. Um, so Stuxnet is in the data set, which uh, is interesting from, uh, th this isn't from a couple years ago, this is from uh, the last 100 or so days. Uh, so that is uh, regularly being scanned and uploaded by uh, either end users or, or possibly researchers, uh, but that is in the minority compared to the rest of the data. Uh, so, so when you do all the counts, uh, uh, Civis, uh, Virut, Salady, uh, Ramnet are all in, in the top list. Uh, so that's why we were talking about P infectors before. The va vast majority of everything we're seeing was exactly that. The low hanging uh, USB enabled uh, P infectors uh, spreading through the environment. Yep. And I would just add, it's always funny to me when folks are like, oh my gosh, we gotta, we gotta defend against Stuxnet. We gotta defend against the NSA, FSB, GRU, AG100. It's like, you haven't patched your system in five years. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. But we gotta focus on the, yeah, the yeah. threats. And it's like, yeah, well, you've got other issues, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Virut isn't sexy, but it is a pain to clean up and it is more, more than likely uh, uh, what you would see in, in your course of your workday. Uh, so if you were to uh, graph uh, the tables, uh, these are the counts based on uh, the, the labels that we did. Um, the Black check mark is an X, and, and the little uh, white one is a check. Uh, uh, so as far as capabilities uh, and timelines, uh, what you're seeing here is the vast majority of all the, uh, uh, the I think this is top 12, no, it's more than that. The top list uh, are all uh, uh, virus-like P infectors and include uh, storage hopping. And, and more, some of the more successful ones, like Virut, also have a Trojan-like capability. Uh, so um, Virut itself is, I think I have a slide on that, there we go. Uh, it uses IRC to, uh, for command and control, uh, and it can download additional payloads. Uh, that doesn't mean it needs IRC to spread, uh, so if you're blocking IRC like you should, uh, uh, egress-wise, it will still uh, spread in your environment uh, through the P infector. Uh, and it can be, uh, speaking from experience, quite uh, difficult to uh, clean up as well because it, it will infect processes as they run. Uh, so you're in a constant uh, kind of battle of fending off the virus as it hops around, especially if you're executing from uh, uh, network shares, then everyone who's executing from that network share is uh, basically compromised uh, very rapidly. And instead of over-focusing on things like can we have IOCs to look for a common piece of malware, uh, you could much more appropriately use a behavior to say, we don't have IRC in our environment. So if we start seeing IRC communication, maybe we're infected with these common pieces of malware that we're seeing inside the ICS, and then take the appropriate action based off that. 
Yeah. And Salady is also a, a very uh, well-known, these, everyone talks about Stuxnet, like we said. Uh, Brew and Salady are in the top list of uh, viruses, yet they're, how, how many, hand, show of hands, how many people have heard of either Brew or Salady? I can't see you. I assume nobody. I see like four hands. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Unknown audience landscape. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but Salady uh, uses a botnet um, very much like uh, Zeus and, and some of the other botnets that you're familiar with. Uh, and it's all based on peer to peer. And it actually has a cool reputation score as well. So if, uh, if its peer has a low reputation, it just stops talking to it and it reroutes traffic to other peers uh, uh, that it's aware of, so neat stuff. Uh, so takeaways there, uh, brute, salady, much more likely to see in the wild. Uh, P infectors are the vast majority of uh, uh, what we saw over the course of the 100 days of, of log collection. And, and so what I would add to that for a base number is we ended up finding around 30,000 pieces of software that were legitimate ICS software being infected. Um, as we tried to hone down the data as much as possible with user submission IDs and the rest, we got to a number of about 3,000. So it looked like there was about 3,000 potentially unique sites that were getting infected in the last, was it 120 or 180 days? Approximately. Uh, and what that says to me is these type of infections are much more common in our environments than people like to admit. But again, it's not the, the world is ending, it's just let's take a better approach to cleaning up our environments. Yeah. It's cyber hygiene. So if you, yeah, so if you come up with 500,000 in a news article eventually, that's wrong. If you hear 200, that's wrong. We're at the minimum around a couple thousand. Yeah. Uh, so so the, that was the first category as far as looking at a high level what the data set says. Uh, now we'll look at some things we already know and if uh, VirusTotal has a unique perspective on that. Uh, uh, so to that point, uh, yep. so talk about So one of the things that, again, I, I'd like to, to note is when we see vendors put out Intel reports, it helps both the adversaries and the defenders. And it's usually a race to take advantage of it. Um, your adversary, I promise you, has a virus total intelligence subscription and it's pulling down samples as you submit. It's why we don't like people to submit actual samples from their environment because then your adversary can see that you're compromised. If it's something targeted, they'll do other actions based on you tipping the hat that you found it. In the same way, we try to have some discussion around the reporting does ICS cert reports, does uh, virus, uh, does, um, you know, reports coming out from Symantec about Dragonfly, do these things actually encourage people to look into their environments? And so that's what Ben's gonna talk about next. Yeah. Um, so there are many eye charts, but this one's mine. <laughs> um, uh, we looked, I, I looked at the uh, uh, four uh, hashes, the four binaries that were published o over the course of approximately a month uh, on Havix, the, specifically the OPC enabled Havix. Uh, and uh, each of those timelines is the timeline of each of those binaries. Uh, the, the very first uh, upload uh, was actually from the United States in April 17th, which is uh, prior to anything being released. Um, I thought that was interesting. Uh, but the actual release itself was first done by F-Secure. Uh, they posted uh, a blog entry June 23rd, uh, and then that same day they uploaded uh, their binary to uh, VirusTotal. Uh, what's interesting from that aspect, uh, the uh, light blue uh, big dots are other uploads. Uh, so you see approximately um, four days later, uh, you see additional uploads to virus total on the uh, two uh, middle uh, binaries. Uh, both of those were uploaded uh, um, in the June, uh, early July timeframe uh, uh, from Ukraine. And then you uh, continue down and you, and you see a pattern of uh, Ukraine uh, and Korea also uploading the samples in a very um, regimented uh, uh, fashion. So each, each day they would upload all three samples and then it progresses. Um, what's interesting is it then kind of jump uh, into the future. Uh, December, uh, one of the binaries was uploaded by Russia and uh, one, one of the binaries I found that wasn't covered in any of the blog posts was uploaded from a site in Israel in January of, um, I think 2016 is what that uh, says. Uh, so uh, nothing that we don't really know, uh, but I found it interesting uh, viewing the uh, Havex campaign in the eyes of Iris Total to see uh, what story that tells. And, and I would add a couple of the takeaways that it was for me. It was number one, 
We generally see vendors pick up things from the ICS community after their submissions of virus total. And so this is the same with like all the Ukraine stuff coming out and everything that's reporting on things that are going on. You can usually track back their, their samples that they're finding to submissions of the virus total months before they're reporting it. So asset owners and operators and security teams that do submit things at times are kicking off that discussion in the community anyways, which means it could have been going on for years before. Um, but also, as the timelines progress and we see more submissions, once the report comes out, there's a misconception that, well, it's done. We've got systems in place and, well, the Dragonfly campaign's over. Uh, but we continually see new and unique samples and modules that aren't being discussed once the press and the headlines clear that we can still see accurately getting submitted to places like Virus Total um, after the fact. Yeah, I, I think from a Havex uh, perspective, uh, having a, a hold in Ukraine and, and some of the activity there is, uh, in hindsight, based on all the activity that's going on there, mm -hmm. uh, interesting that wasn't some, a conclusion that was drawn out early on when Havex OPC enabled was uh, uh, talked about a couple of years ago. Uh, so moving on to Black Energy, I, I took the uh, uh, binaries, the, specifically the, the hashes that uh, uh, Kyle talked about on his Trend Micro report uh, from, I think it's 26, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in February, uh, and, and looked to see what was there. Uh, what, what I found uh, really interesting, and, and why I included this slide, uh, was the night of uh, 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 December 23rd, when Ukraine experienced a power outage was the first time we saw an upload of the kill disk hash uh, uh, from uh, Ukraine, uh, which is uh, really, so I, I believe the power outage began in the afternoon of the 23rd. Uh, this adjusting in, in local time and Kiev time is approximately midnight uh, uh, of that same uh, day and, and well, the day after technically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what you're seeing there is the response activity uh, uh, from, uh, presumably, uh, from folks uh, on site who found Kill Desk, uploaded it to virus total, and you see the artifact there uh, of the actual response activities. And this is also what I'm talking about where your adversary can see this as well. Yeah. Um, as you can imagine, if you're um, whoever did the blackout, because um, nobody likes to say Russia, but if you're, you know, if you, whoever did the outage uh, and you're looking for your victim and you're looking at their submissions, and you see that they're starting to throw kill disk or black energy up on virus total, that's exactly what it would look like where you go, okay, they found my capability, maybe I need to roll a new capability or leverage a different uh, tactic to proceed. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, um, the file path in that last example there uh, is, uh, translates to Dimitri. Uh, so apparently Dimitri had a sample and he uploaded it. Um, uh, which is interesting timeline wise. Uh, so you see it was uploaded at midnight and then they, they uh, uh, went to bed. Uh, in the next morning at eight o'clock, uh, they started again. Uh, and they also, you see an API post uh, uh, suggesting a tool or an automated uh, uh, script uh, began uh, uh, doing stuff. So I, I'm guessing Dimitri was the, the senior guy who, who eventually started uh, working on it after the initial guy who uploaded it the night before. It's my assessment. So new things, uh, next category. Yeah, so the hypothesis <coughs> I wanted to highlight, excuse me, <coughs> was a number of these themed pieces of malware and these themed intrusions. So one of the things I noted is we generally don't have a lot of discussion around ICS themed or specifically targeted. The headlines are always focused around Stuxnet, HavX, Black Energy 2, things like that. Um, when in my assessment and my uh, experience doing instant response cases, it's far more the theming because it works. If you target it towards industrial providers, you can get in. It doesn't need to be some sophisticated capability to do that. Um, I usually joke with folks that in my previous life, um, I had spent time on defense and intelligence, but I had also done offense for a while for the US government, and never in my day did I think to myself, hmm, how do I make this really fancy so that when the defenders find it, they're impressed? Like, that, that never crossed my mind. It was, how do I get on with my day? I've got things to do. So the, in the same way, if it just works, that's awesome. It doesn't need to be fancy. Um, but what I wanted to highlight was there's only a couple of cases where we've seen themed things. So first of all, we've seen like Iron Gate, which the Mandiant team put out, which was researcher stuff. It was never in the wild. It couldn't have infected anybody. It was just proof of concept type stuff. But then we've seen some stuff recently, like uh, Operation Electric Powder from the Clear Sky uh, group. Uh, so Clear Sky is a company in Israel that was looking at specific Israeli power stations that were being targeted and specifically uh, LinkedIn groups and Facebook groups targeting industrial operators to then theme and go after uh, those environments. 
Uh, things like ransomware uh, mask as a Rockwell update, although that one I thought was very trivial. It was like a zip file that just said Alan Bradley and everybody freaked out. Uh, my point here is there's not a lot of these cases and so we wanted to return a, a couple new cases to the community as well. Uh, so the first one uh, was actually I found on Google. Uh, so I, I was doing some research on a binary that I found, which led me to this report uh, that was completely unrelated. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, anyone who, who knows of this particular analysis. I, I've asked around. Uh, but it was found on GFI's website. Uh, they had a random uh, automated analysis report uh, of a binary. Uh, the MD5 is there. However, I couldn't actually find the binary. Uh, either on virus total or anywhere else. Uh, and and uh, what stood out to me is I used to get the, these newsletters, uh, uh, and it, it's from a Department of Energy, a Nuclear Materials Management and Safeguard System is what uh, NMMSS stands for. Uh, safeguards is a, a, a keyword that buzzed off in my head. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, for those not in the nuclear sector, safeguards is generally all of the um, physical security around uh, the nuclear uh, uh, fuel material that's used at nuclear power plants. Uh, so when, when you say safeguards in front of a nuclear person, he is thinking a retired Marine with really big guns who is running from guard station to guard station uh, in a very regimented and, and efficient uh, process to secure all of the, the particular sites uh, at the facility that they care about. Uh, so when I see something uh, themed as uh, safeguards and, and nuclear materials. Uh, that's what's going off in my head. And the dropper in uh, this example used a, a NMMS uh, theme. Uh, so after it executes, it then opens up uh, the PDF uh, in the screenshot here. And as far as I can tell, GFI found it. Uh, it's, it's there. They don't have any sort of uh, person talking about it. It's just an automated PDF, uh, automated report that was generated. It's on their website, and, and presumably it's been there for six years, and nobody's aware of it. And, and that was one of the things we want to be able to find the research in general, is more of the cases that have been there, again, hiding in plain view, but have never been interesting enough to larger IT security companies to even talk about, whereas they might really be important to our community. If you're not getting a lot of submissions on virus total about something, you're not going to get a Symantec or a Microsoft or someone else necessarily looking at that and going, oh, wow, that's cool. Let's take a look at it. If it's flying much more under the radar like this was, this happened in 2011, it's never been discussed before to our knowledge, specifically targeting uh, folks in that sector. And that's why these things can be very important for us as a community. Another example uh, that I found on virus total uh, is uh, a bit more interesting. So it is. As Rob explained uh, from uh, some of the opening slides, a, a downloader. Uh, so this is a very basic binary that goes out to the internet and tries to download malware, and then it executes it. And then uh, uh, typically, the downloader either deletes itself uh, or, or uh, stays in the background running, that sort of thing. Um, but it's not itself having backdoor capability or, or, or spreading in the environment. Its sole job. Uh, generally speaking, is to download something. That's what I call a downloader. Uh, in this particular downloader is uh, themed under uh, uh, Siemens. Uh, so you have the file description of uh, Siemens Automation, uh, product name, or product name, Siemens PLC. Uh, the first instance I found of this uh, was in the wild from uh, November of uh, 2013. And I found a whole series of uh, uh, binaries, over 10, slightly different uh, each time. However, uh, both Siemens and PLC uh, tend to end up in the, the metadata in, in some fashion. And it was last observed uh, this month. Yeah, so there, there's a story there that it unfolds uh, as well that he's going to go into, mostly around the submissions, where it's something that's been ongoing for the last four years. Again, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion of saying this is some new dragonfly-like campaign. It's much more there is an adversary theming specifically towards Siemens automation products that is infecting multiple sites around the world, uh, and only the ones that are getting flagged by the AVs are then being seen um, in public data sets like VirusTotal. I would suspect, but it's an opinion, but I would suspect um, it's much more rampant than what's being flagged by AV. Yeah, we, we don't have, we, we see the, the submissions uh, geographically fairly dispersed. It's not in one country or, or, or anything along those lines. Um, it, but we, we do not know the source of it. So if, 
if I were to have a guess, it's probably a website uh, that is uh, themed, uh, say, a, a PLC training forum or, or something along those lines, uh, where uh, this dropper is being used as a lure to then uh, install uh, um, additional payloads. Mm -hmm. Generally, what we what we saw uh, was uh, when, it, when it first uh, downloads, it grabs a config file. In this case, it's vip.html. Uh, that's encrypted. The, the binary unencrypts that. And then uh, that uh, config file has the uh, remaining URLs that it then downloads uh, more uh, uh, payloads. Uh, all of the samples that I tried were either uh, 404, uh, the site wasn't active, or uh, I found one binary that actually wasn't themed as Siemens at all. It had no metadata attached to it. And I was able to get a packet capture of that, and it was a commodity malware, uh, Chinese Badu uh, themed uh, crimeware type stuff. One of the URLs in the binary was uh, project1.jhtml. If you type that into Google, there's only one result uh, that has that in the URL, which is a Chinese-based ICS vendor uh, 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 that's been around for a number of years and uh, I presume uh, legitimate. Uh, I don't know what the uh, correlation between that URL and uh, the one that we saw in the binary, if there is one, uh, though it's certainly uh, a coincidence uh, that that very unique uh, J in there uh, yeah. is. Uh, and yeah. that's where you can start combining things together. If you did this own research on your own and you looked into your environments and you found something, like maybe your, one of your operators or folks or engineers told you, hey, I downloaded the SEMA software and it exited it out and acted really strange, this is where you could then take this knowledge, go to places like your, your proxy logs or, or any sort of DNS resolutions and say, okay, am I starting to see two or three different things that line up to a pattern to then say there's something malicious in my environment instead of freaking out over a single, single occurrence? Uh, another example, uh, Rob mentioned uh, Alan Bradley uh, uh, themed uh, malware. And, and I, I saw this uh, in previous roles in, in that uh, manual was being used a lot, manual.exe. Uh, and and sometime, most of the time it was not very interesting, like a, a, a bread oven or, or a, a GPS or air brake system. However, occasionally it would have correlations with PLC themed things. Uh, so I know there's been themes of uh, radiological equipment that would be used uh, during outage at a nuke plant. Uh, there is um, uh, Steris Harmony is uh, medical equipment, lights uh, uh, that were used. And um, I had a, another example, and I forget what it was. Um, um, but but th there seems to be a, when you receive it by itself, Alan Bradley, you go, oh my goodness, it's themed after Alan Bradley. Uh, but if you are on a site that's uh, mimicking thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of manuals, then you're going to get uh, that collision occasionally where uh, if you look at the broad theme of things, it's just manuals. And there happen to be a subset of manuals that are themed around uh, PLCs or industrial equipment. That doesn't mean it's targeting PLCs or industrial equipment, it means uh, welcome to the internet, uh, and it, it's going to be used uh, in whatever means it can. Uh, another welcome to the internet, uh, mass mailers. Uh, uh, so I uh, found this, ha had it analyzed, and uh, was concerned initially, ABB, uh, Emerson, and there's also Fujitsu under there. Uh, oh my goodness, they're sending out uh, spear phishing. Uh, but really, it's just uh, alphabetically, uh, A uh, is near, near the top, and then uh, Emerson's down there. I cut some out uh, to, to show the correlation there. Uh, so could it be used uh, for targeting a, a mass mailer, which this was actually a fairly sophisticated uh, a mass mailer that had a lot of anti-forensics and, and a lot of encryption and, and uh, generating legitimate traffic to kind of uh, fall in the background of noise? Um, so it was fairly sophisticated. It could be used for targeting, targeted campaigns um, based on whoever's buying uh, services for email addressing and whatnot. Uh, however, this particular example and, and everything we, we looked at was generally broad the, uh, themed uh, phishing uh, and, and spam that is uh, uh, anyone would see uh, on the course of doing business, including employees of ABB and, and employees of Emerson. One of the reasons we want to highlight this one as well is as your folks are doing security or as you are doing security in the environment, 
Uh, it is definitely a more concerning thing when there's something that's ICS themed or it seems to be targeted, but this is the kind of thing you need to be aware of to also be able to slow that train down a little bit. To say, oh my gosh, I'm starting to see ABB stuff. I'm starting to see Emerson. Maybe this is specific. Uh, and in fact, you need to take a step back, analyze the bigger picture, and realize it, it's a potential risk. Um, yes, we see cybercrime groups selling these types of accesses to more sophisticated groups. But no, we don't need to uh, uh, run to the media or uh, call a giant incident response team in just because Emerson has showed up in a domain request when you're a Siemens site. Yeah, and a lot of those uh, are kind of form letters that are taking like the domain name, uh, so cat.com. Um, it will take cat and it'll put it in the, the email address and so saying you, you remember your account at cat is about to expire. Reading that it looks like it's targeting towards your company. Uh, in reality it's just taking your domain name and cutting off the .com and putting it in there. It's making it look like they know more than they do and I've seen lots of people kind of jump to conclusions based on that kind of data. Uh, also, welcome to the internet. People uh, like to reverse things and crack things. Um, a lot of the, the binaries there, I wouldn't say, are entirely legitimate. Um, uh, but I also found uh, uh, um, key generators for, for uh, every uh, Siemens product imaginable uh, that's available in this tool. Uh, that was uploaded in VirusTotal. Apparently, wherever that person downloaded it, wasn't sure if it was legitimate. Uh, and and uh, uploaded virus total. And so this is a real thing. Um, this is uh, cost of doing business on the internet. Uh, and it, just as Microsoft has problems with it, uh, so do industrial customers. Cool. I'll take this section. All right. So, from a user behavior perspective of what we want you to do differently as well, uh, one of the things we want you to be aware of is those poor OPSEC things. Um, so, one of our hypotheses was with the convergence of IT and OT, with security teams trying to do better in these environments. Uh, we thought there was probably going to be a lot of ICS software that was completely legitimate, but getting flagged as malicious because heuristics compared to our software tends to have a clash. In other words, if it's a heuristics-based AV engine, it's probably going to look at ICS software and get really freaked out. As an example of like a Delta V server, you'll have like 43 child processes that spawn off an executable in anywhere but ICS that's malicious. In our, way, in our environments, that's just custom development by Emerson. So it, it depends on your environments and understanding that our software looks a little different. So let's take a look at it. Number one, one of the things we found was over the last 90 days, over 120 different project files were getting uploaded. There's a lot of them that were exercised or sort of play data, if you will, or test files and, and defaults but a lot of legitimate files as well. So you're thinking of very sensitive data sets getting uploaded to the public databases because they got flagged as malicious when they're not. Uh, a key takeaway there as well is if you're helping your adversary do exfiltration out of your environment, you're shortening their kill chain process a little bit. <laughs> From the data files, we also saw some particular interesting things that were getting flagged that were, again, completely legitimate. Uh, discussions of incidents in nuclear environments. Um, substation mappings, NERC SIP findings, NRC findings, uh, a lot of, again, very sensitive data that does not need to be in public data sets. If you're an adversary and you wanted to understand how a system is laid out and understand how to attack it, uh, if you can just go download a system drawing, an engineering drawing from a public database, again, that's going to help you out. Right? And based, based on the, the one NRC upload, uh, the, the metadata that was attached to that virus total, it uh, appeared to be not the, the end user that uploaded it, but there was a, a vendor that was kind of in the middle that was uh, hosting that file, and it looked like they submitted the sample uh, uh, for being uh, scanned uh, to VirusTotal, which I think should be against their uh, Yes, and, <laughs> their and this contract. is something we've tried to highlight before in classes and when Mike and I give presentations, that your most sensitive ICS data isn't necessarily in the ICS. Other people are holding on to your information. If you don't have some sort of chain of custody around your sensitive information, you may not even know it's being uploaded to such databases. Uh, we also found a ton of installers for legitimate software. So we always talk about in the ICS kill chain construct that an adversary needs to be able to test out their attacks. Well, if they can download your specific versions of HMIs, data historians, alarm servers, et cetera, and download them to their environment and the key generators that you also uploaded and all the information <laughs> around it, you can get a pretty good working environment. I also have a lot of students that come and, and complain that they don't have a test environment of their own to do defense in. Turns out you can probably just go download your own uh, mm -hmm. from the internet and do some testing uh, for, your, for your own security practices. But be rest assured your adversaries are downloading your software that you're submitting uh, through this information. So first of all, scan your public data sets. 
Um, use your security team, search public data sets like VirusTotal, look for your company name, look for your key information, your types of software, find it before it gets indexed, and you can actually call VirusTotal as well and request that it be taken down. Um, granted, we don't want you to submit it in the first place, but as a backup, take all of your sensitive installers and files and get them off the internet, as it were. Uh, one of the things that I wanna highlight as we wrap it up about why that data gets there is generally speaking, there's two methods outside of you that are submitting that data set. Um, your AV is not directly submitting it. Usually they'll do hash checks and they'll see if other vendors see it, but they don't submit the raw files. But what happens is after they're done with their analysis, they'll do bulk data submissions. So you're relying on your AV to know and sanitize your data before they're submitting a bunch of it to VirusTotal. And a lot of end users don't know that. Not all AV systems do that. There are some very reputable vendors that will not. But out of the 50-something on VirusTotal, not all of them are reputable. Uh, the other aspect that happens that we see the biggest offenders is your outsourced IT security teams. So if they've never been inside an ICS, they're not gonna know the difference between a legitimate ICS software path and a, and a malicious one. What happens is they treat VirusTotal like a poor man's sandbox. They take all the different files they're seeing come in through the IT security team and do bulk submissions to VirusTotal. So all of your data, again, is getting auto exfilled based off of outsourced IT security teams. Not all of them are bad, but ask those questions, have in your service level agreement some level of sanitization, and be aware of what's going out there. So in conclusion of our data set, um, and again, a lot of the research that, that been put together, from a virus propagation in ICS, we should at a base be talking about the thousands. From a ICS-themed perspective, we saw a dozen, so we should at least be talking in the tens. Um, from the ICS tailored malware, we still only have Stuxnet, Havex, and Black Energy 2 to our knowledge. I've always surmised there's other stuff out there, but based on the trends of uploads and things that we're seeing, it's unlikely to get indexed in VirusTotal in a meaningful way.